Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 282, recorded at Big Dog Studios in Eugene, Oregon. Today's show is made possible by Mud Pod Design House. Ideas are great. They're what businesses are made of. If you have an idea and want to make it a business, you need a website. MudPodDesign.com makes websites for idea people every day. PracticalHerbalist.com. Get info on plants and plant medicine that's supported by science and tradition at ThePracticalHerbalist.com. We make herbalism practical and easy. ThePracticalHerbalist.com. No matter where we start our journey on the herbal path, the plants are guaranteed to offer us a few perspective shifts as they show us where healing is most needed. Today we're talking with Matthew Wood, herbalist with a Master's of Science in Herbal Medicine from the Scottish School of Herbalism and accredited by the University of Wales, author of many books on herbs and herbalism, herbal educator, and practitioner at the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism about wrapping your mind around plant medicine. Now here are your hosts. I'm Candace Hunter. I'm Patrick Hunter. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. Welcome, welcome, Matthew. Greetings. Hello. It is yes. wonderful to have you here today on this lovely sunny day. It is sunny here too. Yep. Yeah, here it's not. It's really rainy, but that's okay. Oh, well, yay! <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Welcome to the rain. We we went out and did our dance. I, I have yeah. to admit that although I loved Minnesota and I love the Midwest, I do love the warmth and the rain here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So tell me, were you always born to be an herbalist? Is that where you started off? Yeah, I think so. So when I was uh, two weeks old, they snatched me up and took me to uh, Big Cypress Swamp in the Everglades. My dad got, when I was a week old, my dad got hired as a teacher for the BIA on the Seminole Indian Reservation in Big Cypress Swamp, uh, in, uh, which is way down there. Uh, 50 miles in those days, 50 miles by dirt road to the nearest town. And so that's isolated. Oh, yeah. The, ro the road had only been in for two years. And um, English was a uh, second language there. And if you can believe this, the Seminoles had only been in treaty relationship with the federal government for 18 years. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they were wild Indians. Wow. <laughs> <Before that. laughs> yeah. And there still were about half of them had not signed on. And that was until 1963 before the rest of them signed on. And they didn't like being, they didn't like being on the res because as they said, too much Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could see that. And, yeah. <laughs> and actually the minister there actually was a full, full blooded um, seminal. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, but it was still too much for him. But at any rate, <laughs> so I arrived there. I was two, three weeks old. And um, that's where I grew up. And I knew both Mikasuki and English before we left when I was two. I forgot Mikasuki, but but I think I, English is not my first language either. It's just I could tell. It took me, um, I really had a hard time speaking. And, and I, I was a very poor speaker until about age 20 when I realized that astrology would provide me with the language that I needed, a description ah. of types. And after a year, I could talk to other astrologers, but nice. I thought, oh, well, I would like to be able to speak to uh, ordinary people, not astrologers. <laughs> so then it, it took about another year to translate astrological archetypes and ideas into uh, English. And then after that, I became a pr prolific speaker, and I am a Gemini, so I talk, <laughs> talk, talk. So. Yeah, so it was very instrumental that that uh, residing there, and um, so an indigenous language. I mean, only the Western languages really have the syllogism or logic. If yeah, then blah blah blah. Premise, control, conclusion. It's the basis of scientific experiment. It's the yeah. basis of law. It's the basis of religion, really, which is all reasoned out. It's. Uh, but that's not found in indigenous languages. They just describe, they let the, the thing speak for itself. They just describe nice. it, how they experienced it. And then if they want to make an extra point, then they use an analogy, <clears throat> like the doctrine of signatures or, or like astrology, use an analogy or an inference a wordplay. And that gets you to, to communicating what is, and, and the spirit world, there is no, there's no language for that. 
Yeah. It's analogy. And in, anything internal, you have to go by analogy. Yeah. So, so um, that's called, in Greek, they had two, a word for that language. It's phosis. And uh, Heraclitus the Dark spoke that way. And he would say things like, the, same ro the road up is the same as the road down. Huh. Well, there's an inference sense. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I like particularly, he said, uh, that, that, which, um, that which scatters brings together and that which, which uh, scatters uh, and that which, oh, I can't remember, never mind. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, they're just these analogies and often word plays. And, and uh, so, so at any rate, uh, I was thinking differently by the time we came back to Minnesota. And, um, and then uh, I was raised a Quaker, which is another dimension shift. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you read books or see movies, occasionally you have a psychological insight into yourself. Mm -hmm. And I got a great insight from the Harry Potter books in that I realized that my family had been non-muggles for like 10 generations. <laughs> like, oh, oh, they don't get it. <laughs> That's really helpful. <laughs> I never really thought about something like that. But yeah. literally 10 generations of being a Quaker, you're kind of out of the mainstream. My mother's family were Jewish, but they were out of the mainstream too. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I had a very different upbringing and... Um, uh, the emphasis was on that developing your inner guidance, um, which for most people in Quaker meeting is your conscience. But uh, for me, I mean, I really did believe in spirituality. Well, by at age 10 or 11, we went to Wausau, Wisconsin, where we had the grand meeting of Quakers in the upper, upper Midwest, which was a uh, uh, half yearly meeting. And um, the Sunday school teacher or first day school teacher, as Quakers say, was uh, Dr. Francis Hole, who was a soil science professor at the University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison. Dun, 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 uh -huh. Go Badgers. <laughs> Go Badgers. <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he took us up on Rib Mountain, which is just about the only mountain in Wisconsin and uh, 1,800 some feet high. It's not much of a mountain, as you know, we're in the Midwest. And, um, <laughs> and he was I remember he was like jumping in joy from stone to stone. And just this feeling came out of him. Nature is alive. Nature yeah. is alive. And it was like really my first experience of um, transmediumship or um, empathy, empathic communication, you know? Nice. And um, uh, which now comes easier to me. But in those days, I mean, you just didn't meet many people that communicated on that level, right. which would be normal on the, on the reservation back there. But um, this feeling, nature is alive, nature is alive. And I just knew then, I, I knew, I, I can tell you, I knew nature is alive. I actually knew she was a, a female presence who had an actual personality. Um, yes. Like maybe there's other Earths and they have different personalities. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew in that moment, if I did not believe, I would never know spiritual truth again because it was a spiritual truth. Yeah. I, I didn't, I I didn't consciously put this all together. To me, the experience of nature being alive was a soul experience. Like, I am like conjoined with all the souls in yeah. in on Earth, and I won't say the universe, but on Earth. And then, um, uh, also, uh, that but the experience of of that this is a truth that's undeniable. That's a spiritual experience. You have to, you just have to believe or yeah. you'll lose it. It's a knowing. I, it's just yes. a knowing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so that actually was a demonstration of the Quaker principles. Each person has the inward light. That's the ability to determine truth for themselves. And there is a, and there is a, a truth out there. That those are the two Quaker doctrine uh, dogmas. That's all. Oh, that's simple, <laughs> nice and simple. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, so from that moment, from that time on, I really began to build my spiritual life, and I had a, a basic confidence. Also, when I hit, oh, I have to say too, I don't know. I'd be interested in your observations or just something, maybe over the next year, asking people. Uh, 
I actually feel that that's a normal experience in more indigenous societies when you're 10, 12, when you reach from age seven to, to 14, you're kind of doing your um, socialization and, yeah. and the soul is developing. When you're a little, little kid, it's more imagination and stories and, and identity. And then mm-hmm. more the soul, the love and hate and aversion and, and uh, attraction and, and that at towards the end of that, it's natural to feel the soul world is what I believe. And mm-hmm. I have found a few of my friends have felt it at that time in life or then later on. So, um, so at any rate, uh, I, I, I did not yet realize that it took me a long time analyzing that, oh, I see um, a noisy truck passing by. Um, <laughs> oh, I see this is a spiritual truth. Oh, okay. Yeah, I passed that test. Well, I believed it. I mean, I just didn't see any reason not to believe it. Yeah. And then when I was 28, I started, okay. So then when I was 13, I first read, how did I get into herbalism? Okay, secret <laughs> revelation. <laughs> I, I read The Teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. All right. And, <laughs> yes. Uh, summer of 67 when that first came out. And I realized, oh, uh, plants are reference points for consciousness mm-hmm. and they don't change in a million a uh, hundred million years, they're going to be about the same. And human beings, on the other hand, it's just our nature that we change second by second. You know. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, so, uh, but he used hallucinogens. I wasn't that attracted yeah. to hallucinogens, but I realized, oh, plants are reference points for consciousness. So I be- mm-hmm. began the study of herbalism. I was pretty serious about it. And my dad was always kind of an unconscious empath. So he picked up, so lo and behold, he bought some books on herbalism nice. and they were around the house and I was reading them. And one of them was on the doctrine of signatures, a book I recommend uh-huh. it, you can pick it up online pretty cheap. That's uh, the complete herbal by Ben Charles Harris published in 1977 or six um, on the doctrine of signatures. He's a pharmacist, but he wasn't jaded by science. Mm-hmm. And um, then um I, uh, so that, so I studied, I got very into herbalism and then I took botany at the University of Minnesota, but I had no language for how to think really until I studied astrology. Oh, but I remember at least by 18, I had already figured out a little bit of astrology. And when I was, well, that'd be 19. Yeah. Oh, we had field botany, old Dr. Lawrence who came from Oregon and uh, your area, and um, he he was really perceptive. And I gave nice. my presentation, Bur Oak, which is kind of like Valley Oak, oh, yeah. was my choice. You know the Bur Oak and, oh, like, yeah. and stuff in Minnesota. And um, I I just loved that tree, still do. And I oh, gave yeah. the presentation. I everything about it was Saturnian, and I and I mm-hmm. developed this archetype. And at the end of the presentation, he said, "Well, you're not very um, good oral speaker yet." Uh, or you are not a very good oral speaker because I wasn't yet because yeah. I was just starting to study astrology. But he said, but you really understand the the essence of that tree. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, oh. somebody's actually uh, <laughs> understood how I'm thinking. <laughs> and I, I also remember there was a class he developed, but he was a professor emeritus by that time. And the other professor took over. And um, on the first day, I remember the first day of my first day in of the first week of freshman in college. And uh, he said, and so the ancient people thought that the plant looked like, what it looked like was what it was for. Like the walnut inside the shell looked yeah. like the brain inside the skull. Ha, 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 ha. And I was like, I was sitting there stunned in my chair. Oh my God, I learned something at college. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I was a subversive. It took me 14 years to complete my degree, and I, I don't know. I did it maybe just because my parents wanted me to, and I did do kind of a pre-med. I did, um, I did uh, organic chemistry. I realized was just alchemy, and was so yeah. close to pharmacology. It, it would have been kind of interesting if I'd been going to school 30 years earlier. I might have enjoyed uh, pharmacy, but um, yeah. but at any rate, so um, and in those days, school was so cheap. It like you could just fumble along. Oh, hang on here just a second. 
How do you know you're hitting the big time? When you see folks wearing your logo out and about. Ace High Graphics can help you get your logo out there with custom design apparel, like hats and hoodies and tees with custom bags and more. Ace High Graphics can do small runs as little as 10 items or hundreds to meet your needs. We'll help you be seen no matter how large or small you are. Visit acehighgraphics.com today. So then I muddled along until I was 28 or so, and I got a job at Llewellyn Publications, the nice. astrological occult publishing company in St. Paul, which you may know, you'd know something about as oh, a yeah. Neapolitan, a crazy <laughs> place, even more so then. But, you know, it was my element, like from age 28 or 9, um, I could still date it. Jupiter was exactly on my midheaven, like fecundity, <laughs> good, you know. <laughs> Success. Nice. And um, from that time on, I never almost ever worked in a normal setting again. And I worked there two and a half years, and then, in, uh, and then I got a job. I did do a little bit of nonsense work, um, layout and design, but um, just to get by. And then I got to work uh, at the present moment of the herb shop. Bob, the owner of the store, I owe him a lot. He was a deep thinker. He was already middle-aged and he, and pretty ex darn experienced in his various ways and uh, iconoclast like yeah. thoroughly. He was actually a dope dealer and um, all, all the, the the two major herb stores and the first um, holistic uh, uh, or uh, alternative restaurant other than Seward Cafe, the we're all financed by drug money. And, nice. <laughs> and, you know, I, I do have to say, if politicians really had any idea, um, boy, there's a spectacular car here. I got to show you this. Oh. Are you, you, yeah, your thumb's in the way. Oh, <laughs> we couldn't see it. Hey, car. Oh, what kind of car is that? Yeah, I'm a prowler. Oh, a prowler? A prowler? Oh, yeah. 1989? Oh, 99. Yeah, 99, okay. Yeah, they stopped making them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. Um, yeah, so. Oh, wow, that is spectacular. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, this will need some editing, or you can just do it rough as is. I, I kind of like just being a person, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, but... Um, so so i started there and like he didn't mind breaking the law he was like gutsy it's like yeah fda who cares oh uh, we'll just <laughs> you know we'll just go along here and it turned out the fda did send a person out once a year to investigate us to investigate every store in the country like us <laughs> and a woman was looking in the store kind of intently in the window and i was like oh can i help you and she said oh no i'm from the fda we just have to they send us out once a year to look at you, everybody. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so things expanded and, you know, it was an inner city store. So, you know, we got robbed at gunpoint twice. And, um, and even just, I was there a couple of months ago and a really a scarier incident than being robbed at gunpoint occurred, but I won't go into that, but, um, but so it's just the inner city and, um, but it's a great herb store mm -hmm. and um, really serves everybody from the rich to the poor, black and white, uh, less uh, Native Americans now than in the old days, partly because he was he was married to a Native American woman and, and, and their daughter actually runs the store now. So it is uh, Native owned. And um, so, um, so at any rate, I started there. It took me about a year to gain momentum gain traction. And I had to study homeopathy instead of herbalism because I just couldn't understand astringent, mucilage, diaphoretic, diuretic, all that stuff, which is really old time yeah. medicine from before 1950. Yeah. And that had died out and there was no explanation. And we, there were no teachers really. So few of us had teachers. Um, I mean, yeah. like I can think of three people who, you know, mentor took over from, you know, their grandma or their mother or something. So probably car, this car even sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
Wow. Well, that could have been an advertisement there. <laughs> yeah, they don't they don't make those anymore. No, they don't. Yeah. Yep. That was he's, a bright yellow one too. Yeah, he's probably enjoying the last few warm nights of of, of fall and yeah. before it changes. Yeah. yeah, I would not want to drive that in uh salty no uh, icy weather of the upper Midwest. No, definitely not. Yeah. Okay, so um, so, that, so, I so that brings learn. you, where, where yeah. are we at in your timeline? So that's what uh, you're looking at your 30s. 28, now. 29, um, 30. I am starting to work at present moment herbs and I'm just slowly learning some herbal medicine here. So I, so the way I learned herbalism, I couldn't understand the books. Um, there were no good books yet. It would be another year or two before um, Michael Tierra's Way of Herbs was published. Yeah. The, the yeah. books in those days were Maud Grieve. Um, which is not a book to practice from. No. Jethro Plus, which is totally based on that old-fashioned medicine. Mm -hmm. Joseph Meyer, which is also... So I, I couldn't understand anything. So I carefully studied the homeopathic remedies that are also herbs, and they're used the same way in homeopathy as in herbal medicine. That would be St. John's Wort, Hypericum, Sambucus, Elder, Bone Set, that's Eupatorium per perforatum, perfoliatum. And then uh, Eupatorium uh, purpurea, the gravel root, one or two more. I understood them well. And then the Doctrine of Signatures, I began to study yeah. and learn. And the oak, I mean, I pretty, oh, that's really astringent. That's a, so it contracts, it binds. I'm beginning to learn that. It establishes integrity, the mighty oak. Yes. And so Dr. Bach taught oak is the remedy. And then from the flower essences, if I could st understand the mental emotional state, I yeah. could understand more of the analogies to the physical state because I believed in the yeah. law of correspondence, of course, that it corresponded to um, the mental, emotional corresponded to the physical. Mm -hmm. So agrimony is a remedy for mental tension, physical, physiological, and then also for physical tension. Everything from passing a gallstone to just being uptight to <laughs> chills and fever, which is a momentary yeah. tension. So agrimony, I understood well. Blue vervain or vervain, remedy for stiff neck, fanatic, intense. Um, oak for integrity, trying to out integrity the issues of life, kind uh -huh. of uh, paraphrase Dr. Bach. And my friend Susan once needed it because uh, she was bucked off a horse and the veins uh -huh. just huge um, bluish black with yellow around them, which I had found that's a good in specific indication for oak. So I gave her oak. And um, and after a week, she said, "Oh, I see. This is a this is a remedy to help you um, learn the battles you can win." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a horse that could be ridden. Yes. But she she found that that was the horse that could understand her and talk yeah. to the other horses. Yes. So it had a function even then. Yeah. And uh, so. Um, so I began to learn the herbs there. It was the Doctrine of Signatures, the Bach Flower Essences, the um, homeopathy, and then experience year after year. And within a short time, I knew, you know, 20, 30 herbs pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I've been learning ever since. So, yeah. And I, I began to teach and to practice. And after a little while, so to practice. When did yeah. you start? Uh, when you went? When did you go to the Scottish? Um, university? Yeah, so this would have been 1982 that I started at present moment. Um, it was about 2000, 2001 that I started at the Scottish School of Herbal Medicine. So it was after 22, 20 years of practice, and I was making enough money. It was a great write-off. I could fly to Europe. We had winter classes in Mallorca and Spain. I should actually. <laughs> I never thought of, I never thought of this until this moment. But I should actually have stayed there an extra month, and I could have written that off. I suppose too. Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> and then Scotland was pretty nice in the summertime, and learning long distance. And uh, I learned to read scientific papers, and um, which is good to know. Yeah. And. Um, I like getting that credential. I, I'd been a member of the American Herbalist Guild for oh, 20, 30 years almost, and 
yeah, 30 years. I'm not anymore considering myself current, but so I like to have, uh, it's nice having that credential. And um, so, so yeah, we, we uh, that was good. Uh, and in between that time, so I practiced eight years at the store or worked there on and off. And then a couple of years during that at a chiropractic clinic. And in the nineties, by 1992, by 1990, 92, I was already practicing on my own with my own office here or there and out at my uh, Sunnyfield herb farm out in, in Minatrista, near where you grew up. Yeah. And uh, Candace. And um, um, then, uh, so, you know, I, I, I'll give this testimony. Herbalism ultimately is a empirical science that is an experience-based way of learning. And it doesn't matter how much science you apply to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, this molecule in this slot, et cetera, like a drug, it is not, that's not going to get you very far. There's like about yeah. 40 herbal substances that are known what they do. So that yeah, that's just not enough to practice on. And um, uh, so it's experience-based. And, and I was asked yesterday, well, um, when do you consider, you know, how long does it take to be an herbalist? And I say, you can be a master herbalist from day one. You just need to know one herb that does one thing really well, yeah. reliably, like calendula or something, and yeah. or St. John's Wort or Solomon's Seal, I would say. Mm -hmm. But um, but after about 15 years, you really do know something, and you know that you know a lot, and you know that you don't know it all, and you never will. So yeah. you have a humility there too. And after 25 years, you find that everybody that's been practicing for 25 years they all know the same stuff even okay. and and if they don't when you're talking to them oh i see you know it's like oh i knew that about skull cap but i didn't know that but that fits together it all fits yeah. together you just click 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 yeah so so that's what an empirical art or science is and that's what i learned at present moment too so um so uh yeah that brings me down by and then i i had my own practice till about 2010 or 12 and then i i still see people i moved out to the country way out uh, in wisconsin not as accessible as my minnetrista was only 35 minutes from downtown minneapolis so i'd see people there yeah. i could have built up a practice there um but i moved on and moved to wisconsin 45 minutes out of st paul and i don't hardly ever see anybody out here in person i don't make the effort but i treat people at zoom or i go into the present moment still and see people there occasionally and uh, and I I traveled and taught everywhere uh, in Oregon and California, I, just about every state over the last thirty some years. But when COVID came, March two thousand twenty was my last my last uh, yeah. trip, and uh, I I asked the woman if she wanted to stop the class because I was you know because COVID and everything, and she didn't want to, and I was a little bit like I think you should, but. But I didn't mind getting it. I wanted to see what it was like, you know. And um, <laughs> so I got COVID. And I did, one of the students who was a dear friend of mine did get very sick. And she had long hauler syndrome for a year. So, oh. you know, I did spread it. So I felt bad about that. But but um, we both learned a whole lot. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> COVID, usually for someone who's at all mystical, it makes you dream and dream and dream oh, yeah. and dream of visions. and. Oh yeah. And that, yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, I, it went through our house. I, I'm pretty sure it went through our house. We don't have any tests or anything, but yeah. um, it was right at the very beginning. So in the January, yeah. February time frame. but yeah. I had some pretty big dreams and visions about it and some very clear messaging from yeah. the COVID spirits as it were. And, you yeah. Know, I don't talk about it much because I still like even out here in Eugene, I look kind of weird and crazy when I talk about these things. So yeah, we yeah. we that was our, <laughs> our our experience. We were we were the weird hippie guys family yeah. in Minnesota, and we came out here and we were like totally mainstream. We we didn't even touch the the woo woo here. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> we were the we were the norms here. Yeah, it was refreshing. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, totally different uh, culture. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I lived in Portland for a while, which I, I wouldn't do now. It's just so chaotic. And then in Ashland for yeah. the last two winters, last winter I spent at home. 
but um yeah uh well ashland's a little different uh i still am, i'm not sociable almost anywhere i am but but uh, at least in portland they got great bookstores and stuff so they do <laughs> they have yeah they have a wide variety of of interesting people in portland yeah <laughs> so. Yeah, and very uh, home to uh, natural alternative medicine. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I would say from that time on, I, I just, by that time, by 2000, the early 2000s, my, I, I didn't learn a whole lot more about um, herbal medicine. Uh, well, so I learned more about energetics. Mm -hmm. I, I worked out the six tissue states, which is old fashioned Western herbalism, corresponds with Greek medicine, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda. I learned Vata Pitta Kapha, which is necessary, which has kind of become part of normal ma uh, mainstream alternative uh, right? speech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's pretty cool. And um, uh, And I knew a lot of specific medicine like um what symptom indicating what remedy even if i didn't understand that much about the plant but it just went on and on i learned and learned so then you get your second saturn return my first saturn return brought me to present moment my second saturn return 56 i'm 67 now it made me i like oh but what's the spiritual purpose in all this what i mm -hmm. i want to get back to i want to teach really about nature wisdom which is what i learned on that rib mountain when i was a kid Oh, by the way, I when I was 31, I'd been working at present moment for a couple of years, and I went to uh, Madison. I had a, a drive through Madison, and I visited Francis Hole, the soil science professor, and and I called ahead and everything, and I arrived at his house, and he was retired by then, and widowed, so he was by himself. I'm sure he enjoyed the visit, and uh, I thanked him for that uh, that lesson, and he. Yeah. He was modest, so he didn't he didn't actually acknowledge it. He just said, uh, "Oh yes, that was a beautiful day," and and it was. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> and then I said, "Yeah," and I based everything I teach. You know, the herbal medicine is based on that knowledge that nature is alive, nature wisdom, and I also it's kind of the covert behind the scenes thing I'm trying to teach through the herbalism too. And he sat back and he said, uh, "You have chosen well. People crave that." knowledge but they can't get to it so you will always be in demand yeah and i was like stunned kind of uh yeah. well who but a quaker elder would say you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's why that's why i felt like i later like oh i'm i'm not from a muggle family here at all and in fact um in francis's there somewhere there there's an obit for him and it says uh he there's several stories about him and by him and he said when he was, a, he went to a Georgetown Boys School, which is like the Hogwarts of Quakerism. <laughs> My great grandfather went there too. He got kicked out, but um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but Francis went there. And uh, when William Worcester Comfort was the headmaster, very famous headmaster, and and he said Francis said, uh, Comfort never said anything in meeting, but he just emanated the verities of education. It's like, <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way hogwarts would really be run <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and another and another thing he said was yes i learned of divine love bouncing on my grandmother's knee when i was two years old oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's now passed on to ah yes he was um he he wanted uh, his initials not to be PhD, but um, NYS, um, not yet soil. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, you you've done so many things. I mean, you yeah. you, you go through your 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 fifty year career here, and, and it's what yeah. like what phase I guess was the most pivotal for you the most the thing that made it all work was it you know being a teen in in florida was it you know working with this guy on the hill was it you know what, what would you say well that was an experience that will last a lifetime so that was a major experience on the mountain yeah um 
And I would say the days, the early days at present moment were like the glory days, you know, like, like the twenties for me, were just getting by being an oddball, studying astrology, um, you know, and liking nature. So working outdoors, some things, but, uh, the glory days, because nobody else was doing alternative medicine much. So everybody came to the herb store, all the weirdos came. Nice. I mean, we were like a Mecca for the weirdos yeah. and, you know, now there's a hundred other stores. And so there, there's a hundred other places people go to. And um, there were just so many memories and so many case histories that were just astonishing. So when I was 35, I'd been there. Uh, so maybe six years or so I've been there for a while and I got, and I met my friend, Susan, Susan Yerrigan, she came in and little uh, 80 pound, uh, five foot one spitfire. <laughs> just a sec do you put these chairs away or no are, are you gonna have to oh okay yeah all right okay so so i met her and uh, there were bob and i you know and we came in the store and we kind of laughed at her because she was like an a total crazy person trying to act normal and, <laughs> <Nice. laughs> and bob and i Bob and I were laughing. She said we were like the big bad wolves, like laughing. <laughs> you know? nice. and, uh, uh, but we got to know her and save her life, really, because she had Crohn's disease. She was like oh, ulcerating to death. And mm -hmm. we stopped that. And um, nice. um, there were so many funny stories with Susan. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, so I lived out at Sunnyfield Earth Farm. And when I arrived, then the gnomes showed up. And and I wasn't expecting them. And, and I had a dream that there were gnomes in my garden. And, and they, there was a head gnome was like, he was dressed like a Puritan minister with a little collar and black and white reading out of a big book. And I tried to look at it and he was like. <laughs> <laughs> Not sharing. <laughs> and, and, the next, and the next day, my uh, apprentice, Lise, mm -hmm. who's a full-time herbalist nowadays in Minneapolis, Lise Wolf. She uh, she was out there in the garden and um, she uh, um, and she came in looking really spooked and and she said, Kelly, I just had the feeling there's something dead buried in the garden. And I said, oh, the gnomes are having a funeral. That's what it was. And, <laughs> and, and I said, oh, that's nothing. That's just the gnomes. They're just having a funeral. I dreamed about it last night. She said, oh, oh OK. OK, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were many a stories. That was the glory days too, life at present moment. And uh and then uh my native Muskogee teacher, Tismal, who lived in Minneapolis for a long time, he said, I asked him about it and he said, Oh, you gotta remember they do the reverse of everything we do. So a funeral for them was more like a, a birth, a birth, you know. Yeah. They're still out there. <laughs> nice. uh, even after I move. They they still think I own it, you know, which yeah. kind of irritates the present owner i can tell i, I went and talked about it but, <laughs> but <laughs> i guess i do own it even if i did sell it but uh okay so um so susan so one day she's lying in bed getting ready to, so she had this terrible ulceration i mean yeah. she had scars everywhere like 40 i mean the decisions it took a half year to slowly heal up because her immune system was so hot she had crohn's mm. disease she had a gunshot wound all sorts of things oh. uh, from childhood from uh, teenage years and um so she so she's lying in bed getting ready to go to sleep and there's a bouncing on her bed and then the gnomes they jumped in, a couple of them jumped into her and i right away when she told me about this i said oh oh those are the gnomes there they're just putting a patch on your intestine <laughs> <laughs> no problem <laughs> did i oh. did i lose something here i i think i lost something where did the I'm thinking someone that gave you literal gnomes and there's not literal gnomes. There's spiritual gnomes or something. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. The land spirits. Right. Are you sure that was matcha tea you were drinking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was an innocent uh, bystander. They just showed up on their own. <laughs> they, yeah. they knew they had a safe space there. They could show yeah. up and it'd be good. <laughs> yeah. So like, so she later got, uh, involved in American Native American spirituality, and she was out on uh, Bear Butte, like getting ready to go into a sweat lodge with one of the medicine men. And he said, uh, "Amos, he's no longer with us." And he said, uh, "And they were the last two. And he said, 
oh, there's little people on the mountain. I, this is the first time I've ever seen them. And she said, oh, they have nothing to do with me. That's not, uh, it's not mine. <laughs> she was always afraid she was doing something wrong, you know. So, <laughs> so and then about another couple months later, they, they jumped off on, out of her onto the bed and then, and she recovered. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Was Years amazing. later, I had another friend. She's still not out of the woods, but she did get help. Um, so she needed some heart surgery and it was hard to get. So um, uh, I said, oh, well, you could use, you need surgery. Well, maybe the gnomes would help. Like, so yeah. I talked to them and they came, first they came to me, I was in California. Then they went to her and she said, oh yeah, all, all night they were working on me. It was like, blah, 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 blah. like guys repairing the street or something in my chest. <laughs> yeah. And the next time, and you know how you make a pie, you flute the edges like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the next time she goes, and she was a cardiac uh, nurse, so she got to see the x rays. So the next time she went to the cardiologist, he, he took out these x rays, and, and there was this line on her heart about that long that was fluted. <laughs> <laughs> so they were busy uh, repairing. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, so those were the glory days, indeed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this didn't happen every day, although it, it happens every day to Susan, maybe. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, another. So actually, so also my shamanism was developing. I call it. So the, yeah. I just came out with a book. We can talk about that when we get to books. Uh, um, seven guideposts on the spiritual path. Uh, the the shamanic story in Genesis, because Genesis is just totally a shamanic story. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, I'll send you a review copy, actually. Oh, so, I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. Get me your um, your uh, address after the class. Yeah. Yeah. So or the interview. Um. So, uh. So indeed. So like one of the experiences. Well, I was thirty-one. So again, glory years at the early years of the herb store. Um. This friend of mine from up north Ojibwe, she kept on badgering me to go see a certain medicine man. So the second I said yes, I felt this tube break in my th throat. Thunk. Uh, Castaneda describes this perfectly. And then this medicine man was smoking me, and the smoke went all through me. And then I, in the next couple of weeks, I had all these visions. I did go to visit him, and um, but I had the experiences on the inner plane, and one of them was uh, meeting the Lord of the underworld. His face mm -hmm. was just a darkness, and he introduced me to the, he said, point and introduced me to the wolf being and was sitting like a wolf on two, le on two legs under the yeah. lamp of the inner city, like, <laughs> what do we got here? <laughs> and, the Lord the said, and now we are going to make a psychic link between you and the wolf person. I was like, wait, wait, wait a second. I've studied occultism and shamanism, but I, but I don't want some familiar animal in the underworld. I don't want to be linked to it. I was like, too late. <laughs> but that was a that was a change too, and because you get more solid, lucid dreaming after that, because mm -hmm. you get eyes and ears in the spirit world. Yeah. Is what, yeah. So, um, Susan at Susan being this little eighty-one pound like dark eyes like obsidian flints um she dreamed of the alligator oh, and yeah. um uh, and i'll tell you yeah so i'll tell you her dream because it's just crazy it's, it's crazy like mine but 10 times more like so she's at a um peace conference at the center of the galaxy and all the species yeah. from all the worlds are there it's like star wars or something and there come and she's at the human booth. She was manning the human booth, and she said, <laughs> "Let me and let me tell you, we humans are pretty boring." Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and then in the distance, she sees the king of the alligators is coming with a whole line of like two miles long of alligators. There, she oh, wow. says they're like ready to kill anything, and they, and they come right up to the her booth, and there's the king of the alligators looking at her, and um. She said, have you ever felt the calm of terror? <laughs> I said, well, no. <laughs> she was worried about the other humans, so she said, get the gun. And then immediately she strung up on this post in front of everybody, like, you blew it. This is a peace conference. Like, oh, oh, 
Travis. And so she gets a ruby necklace she's bringing to the king of the alligators to like make peace. And she goes there and he doesn't really, it, uh, he doesn't like it. Oh, he also says, if you pull a gun, you better use it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes there and she's in the court of the king of the alligators and he's not impressed and there's this woman with a long dress going back and forth yelling kill her kill her and there's a snake tail going out from below her dress and, and finally she says kill the bitch and then oh, susan God. wakes up oh, oh gosh <laughs> and then she was going out with this guy and two two weeks later he had a dream about her as she came up out of the lake and she was half human and half alligator yeah. and they never went out again. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, uh, I'm glad to tell the story because she's had a stroke. She can't talk very well now. Oh. But um, she said, um, yeah, just when you think this stuff is all a load of crap, it ruins your sex life. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, so nice. yeah wow well that was some of the glory days there and uh um, well you you do speak of it fondly you just lit up when you talked about it oh it was, yeah yeah yep yeah i learned my herbalism i got my you know herbal spurs there and it was what came in was different from when you have an office and you yeah. see people by appointment it, it you don't get paid as much but it's, it's really more, interesting yeah it's more interesting that way i think because yeah when you have an office and see people isn't that there's a certain set of expectations people have when they show up and they've yeah. already begun the self-editing process because yeah. that's what we're trained to do with modern western medicine yeah yep yeah so it's when more did formal you when did yeah. you open the institute? The yeah, let's see. So three, four, no, four or five years ago, I was teaching in Portland, actually. And I thought, oh, I said to some friends, I'd like to, we would figured out that I could at least handle Zoom and do <laughs> some uh, classes on Zoom. So we started up, my friend Tara and John in Hutchinson, Minnesota, west of, mm -hmm. you know where that is, mm -hmm. yeah. west on, on five or seven, whatever. And, um, and uh, so we started doing that. Um, uh, once a month, herbs A to Z, uh, we called it Materia Medica, but it turned out that a lot of beginners don't know that name. So right. herbs A to Z, we call it now. And gee, we just charged $8 a month. We still charge $8 a month. And um, um, wow, it just tremendous interest. And actually it yeah. started to pay pretty well too. And starting with that, it was kind of accidental um, founding of the Institute. And we added more and more classes. And finally we formalized it and we're, okay, we're going to try and do a first year, second year, third year, we're within one or two classes of getting the first year all set. Then we um, will, uh, we're coming along with the other things too, but, and just collecting a lot of interesting stuff and sometimes interviews with people like this. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, sometimes more technical on herbalism, sometimes less so, sometimes life stories. Um, because my generation is, you know, starting to fade away, you know, yeah. a little bit, you know, we lost William LaSaucier, probably the best of the, oh, the best, of, I mean, really a great herbalist 2003 before we could really record things like this. And it was, or it's on tape, you know, literal tape. Yeah. His lectures. And um, so, uh yeah, so that's the, the Institute. And then we were in a good position when COVID hit and everybody wanted and needed stay-at-home education. And wow, uh, we really prospered and we're still doing great, but actually plain leveled off a little bit yeah. with the end of, uh, the kind of end of the kind of epidemic, whatever. Yeah. Epidemic. Yeah. yeah. The end of stay-at-home orders in many places anyway. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, I have to, so, I mean, I, I want to thank you for having done all the writing you've done because the first herbal book I ever actually read was the book of herbal wisdom. And yeah. for me, I grew up, there's a lot of things I've known, but I can't put it into words. I never have the right words. And you gave me a language that finally I was like, oh, thank God, somebody understands 
what I've been trying to say and can even say it like yeah, in words. It's awesome. And it's not, you yeah. know, I, I just, I was so grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that, like for me, the exact same thing. <clears throat> and I learned astrology, translated back into English. I became yeah. very proficient at uh, being able to say complicated things um, in ordinary language. And that is my books. And that will be the holistic medicine and the extracellular oh. matrix, which we're going to talk about. Yes. That really, that is a, some putting something very hard to visualize that neither the alternative nor the conventional people can figure out <clears throat> what yeah. it is almost. And yet it's the foundation, oh, yeah. <clears throat> the, inner, the inner ocean that everything floats in. And um, I tried to make that totally accessible to at least the holistic people. You did. And that'll help. That, that, yeah, that's an awesome, I mean, that, this sounds cheesy, I know, but that book was a revelation for me. And oh. I mean, I actually like uh, partway in when there's, um, I think it was the, if to remember the section that you were talking about, the regulation, regulating reverse and rebound effects, that whole section where you're talking about explaining the the um the laws of similars and contraries but also cure and you know the idea of using small doses as opposed to large doses i cried i kid you oh. not i i'm gonna i'm gonna read the quote oh, that made now. me cry wait now i'm gonna Maybe make we should, I'm, i don't know we we're talking no, no. about the book that's the that's uh, the, the book is show. the book is coming out the book is okay. coming out very okay. soon here no here's should we should we take a break and go on to the book I've, I've no, talked about? No, I'm no, going to no, read yeah. this quote right now because this is important to me. I'll read it again next time, too. <laughs> the quote, the organism, or, organism reacts to forces that reinforce or challenge it by opposition. I realize that's not like a profound quote, but for me it was because it describes what I think of as the mule principle of herbalism. And the more mule-like or, I yeah. mean, mule-like burrow nature, the more burrow nature one has in one's personality, oftentimes the same thing applies to one's physicality and the way that one deals with illness. Yeah. And, yeah. and it means the smaller doses of medicine, the small, like one to three drops. That's what Dawn used to give me. She's your student. And, and she was... Yeah. One of my, the first one who introduced me to herbalism and she would give me these formulas and it would have like one, she'd say, take this, you know, three drops of this three times a day. And then she would give Patrick a formula and she'd say 20 drops three times a day. And for the last 15 years, it really perplexed me. Why is it that, you know, one to three drops for me, 20 drops for him? What? And I realized when I read that, that thing, I was like, oh, cause I have so much more mule nature. Sometimes he refers to it as ass nature. <laughs> but, I don't think I've ever said that. I don't think I've ever said that. You thought it. I know it. I know it. <laughs> but that yeah. section in the extracellular uh, matrix, the holistic guide to extracellular matrix, whatever, that, that section in that book really suddenly made it clear as to why for some people, just a teensy yeah. bit is much more effective for other people. A slightly larger amount, maybe not, not huge, but you know. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for um, understanding that section. I I've always had a hard time explaining those particular principles. I'd say that was just about to me the thing I worried about most in that book. Um, yeah, the reverse effect, which is a law of similars and a law of contraries built in, yeah. and the rebound effect and so on. And uh, so, yeah, I, I truly am grateful that someone could understand it. Yay. Oh, yeah. No, it was a very elegant explanation. And the way that you knit science and traditional language together and the uh, metaphors, the imagery that you used as you were doing so, it, it was wonderful. So thank you. You know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, should we go on to the books then or... Yeah. So, so the thing is, is that, um, how can, you know, that, that was a really good segue into the next show. How can we, how can people get a hold of you? How can they find you? Yeah. So the Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism is on Facebook or well, all over, wherever on the web, that kind of stuff is. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not a geek. <laughs> <laughs> Woodherbs.com would be my 
website and um uh, i guess i don't mind people you know knowing my email greenmedic at gmail.com but don't waste my time but, <laughs> uh, so um so at any rate that would be my contact information yeah and then i will make sure all those are in the show notes and links to all of your books of course yeah all right so at the end of our our shows we we ask our our guest to to say our tagline with us and that tagline is put an herb on it so put an herb on it yeah yep, put, an, put herb an herb on, on it. it right so i'm going to say one two three and then we're going to say i'll say put an herb on it ready one yeah. two three put, put an, an herb, herb on, on it, it. <laughs> perfect <laughs> all right thank you so much the statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with a healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication, or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.